Good evening. My name is Paul Pope. I'm a clinical professor in the LBJ School and a senior fellow of the Intelligence Studies Project uh, here at UT Austin. The ISP is a joint enterprise of the Clement Center for National Security and the Robert Strauss Center for International Security and Law, and those three organizations are uh, hosting this event this evening, which we're grateful for. Uh, we're honored to have with us John Brennan uh, in his first appearance on campus in his role as a distinguished non-resident scholar and senior advisor to the Intelligence Studies Project. Uh, the director of the ISP, Steve Slick, asked me to introduce Director Brennan, and I'm going to do that in just a minute, but before we do, I just thought I'd tell you a bit about what's going to happen tonight. Uh, after I introduce the director, he will come and give his remarks, and then he'll be joined here in these chairs by Steve, who will ask a few questions himself and then lead a moderated discussion uh, with questions from the audience. So, let me say that uh, I first met Director Brendan when I didn't have any gray hair, our knees were good, and he had all of uh, John Brennan was sworn in as the Director of Central Intelligence uh, March 8, 2013. Before becoming Director, he had served for four years at the White House as Assistant to the President for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism. During that time, he advised the President on all counterterrorism matters and strategy and helped coordinate the U.S. government's approach to Homeland Security at large. Mr. Brennan began his service at the CIA uh, in 1980. He worked there until 2005. He spent most of his early career in the Director of Analysis as, as an analyst, specializing in the Near East and South Asia before uh, directing counterterrorism analysis in the early 1990s. In 1994 and 1995, uh, I'll be interested in some of my students, they've read Priest's book, he was the intelligence briefer to President Bill Clinton. After his assignment as Chief of Station in the Middle East, Mr. Brennan served from 1999 to 2001 as Chief of Staff for Director George Bennett. <coughs> Bennett, I'm sorry, Tennant. I actually know who the director was. <laughs> <laughs> He's not here, he would give me major static. For that <laughs> Mr. Brennan next worked as Deputy Executive Director of the CIA until 2003, which I have to say, sir, I think has one of the coolest acronyms, Dexter. He was the Dexter. Uh, when he began leading a multi-agency effort to develop what would become the National Counterterrorism Center. In 2004, he became the, center, the center's interim director. He retired from the agency in 2005 and worked in the private sector for three years before being called back to service by President Obama. Mr. Brennan graduated from Fordham University with a bachelor's degree in political science. While enrolled at Fordham, he um, studied abroad at the American University in Cairo and studied Arabic. But of all the great accomplishments I've just mentioned, the one I'm happiest to report is he is a returning Longhorn. Uh, he earned his master's degree in government with a concentration in Middle Eastern studies on the 40 acres in 1980. So will you please join me in welcoming one back one of our own to the coolest town in the world, the Honorable John Brennan. Thank you, everyone. It's really wonderful to be back here in Austin, and uh, <clears throat> it is also very uh, nice to be able to come back to uh, see some uh, former close colleagues and friends, uh, like Paul Pope and Steve Slick, and also to have Bill McRaven as the Chancellor of the UT system. Um, I have such fond memories of my time in UT, and uh, it was when my wife and I first got married, uh, I was mentioning before, our honeymoon was driving down from New Jersey to, uh, to Texas. And uh, if any of you were here at the time, you wouldn't recognize me uh, because I had long hair and earring and all my original joints. <laughs> and I do not have any of those anymore. <laughs> But uh, and I can vividly recall uh, when I was in the government department here as an adopted program, uh, trying to learn more about government as well as the Middle East. And uh, contemplating a career in, in the government, uh, when I was called by the CIA after having filled an application, for them, having an interview here in Austin, and having then a great opportunity to, to join the CIA. And so my wife and I, in late July of 1980, we packed up our Datsun 510 and drove up to uh, Northern Virginia and embarked on what would be my career at CIA not knowing what was going to be ahead of me. 
and I had the, the great, great fortune of being able to be part of the storied institution of CIA and work with some of the most dedicated patriotic men and women for 25 years. Um, and then when I retired, I failed at the first retirement um, in terms of uh, coming back into government, but it was something that once it gets into your blood, when President Obama gave me the great privilege of asking to return to government, there was no way that I was going to say no. So I am very fortunate that I had the, the, the background, the training here at UT, as well as my undergraduate institution of Fordham University in New York. And what I'm doing now in my second retirement is trying to get retirement rights. So I'm spending a lot of time with my family, reconnecting, because as anybody in the national security intelligence world knows and has experienced, you really do dedicate your life to the work. And it is the families, it is the spouses, it is the children, it is the parents, the ones that make the most sacrifices. And it's one of the things that I always say is that uh, the sacrifices that a lot of our uh, public servants make, it's because of the great support and love that they have at home. And I certainly was a beneficiary of that. But what I've tried to do in this retirement is to give back a little bit uh, to the two alma maters that were so uh, instrumental in launching me on my professional career. And that's why I am now affiliated once again with the, the great University of Texas at Austin as well as with uh, Fordham University. Both universities offered me to be a distinguished fellow and a distinguished scholar, and I could never turn down an offer to be distinguished anything anywhere. So <laughs> it's really great to, to have that moniker now attached to me. But what I try to do in my engagements, and I do some speaking engagements uh, around the country, is I really do emphasize the importance of public service. It is something that is very important to me. I am the son of an immigrant, my father was born and raised in Ireland and came to the United States at the age of 28 in 1948. I remember as a young man, my father telling me just how much America meant to him when he was growing up in Ireland in the 20s and 30s at a time of great poverty there. And the United States, America really symbolized to him uh, the land of opportunity, the land where anybody can be able to uh, advance themselves and, and reach their dreams. And so I always took as very special that I had the birthright of being American. And as a young man, a young boy, uh, my father would tell me stories about uh, just how important America is. And I became a voracious reader of our, our history and just how special we are as a, as a country. And it is one of the things that I have always taken with me, just the, the specialness of, of America. I am somebody who truly and deeply believes in American exceptionalism. Not because Americans are better or smarter than anybody else. It is because we live in a country that has had just tremendous good fortune and has been blessed uh, with such a, a great uh, land of natural resources, navigable rivers, arable land, sea coasts, borders. And we also are the beneficiary of being the melting pot for this globe. So that we're able to leverage the talents uh, and the, the creativity of people from all over the globe. And therefore, um, I take American exceptionalism as something that is very special and something that we also have to make sure that we live up to that exceptional good fortune. And that's why I believe that with that exceptional good fortune comes exceptional responsibilities, particularly in the, in the world because uh, of our great abilities uh, to help influence and shape uh, the world, uh, given our strength, our economic strength, our political strength, our military strength, and the strength of our example. And that's, to me, what really lies at the, at the root of American exceptionalism. This country is truly the greatest and most successful experiment in democratic principles and values. We are a land of tremendous wealth, tremendous prosperity, innovation, imagination, security, liberty, freedom, and equality under the law. And yes, we do have challenges. And I think uh, if you pick up the paper any day or listen to the news networks, you realize that we do have issues that we need to confront here as a country. We have inequality in wealth and income. We also have issues related to violence. We have issues related to prejudice and bias. Uh, but these are the things that through the course of our history we've had to work through. And I think it's very important for us to recognize that uh, while we have these problems, we also, though, are part of a society, part of a country that truly is exceptional. 
Now, we are all beneficiaries of this American greatness. Uh, all of us here today um, have benefited from being in America, whether you're an American citizen or not. And consequently, at least in my mind, um, I believe that we all have an obligation to contribute in our own way to keeping this country strong, free, prosperous, and safe. I think it's one of the things that come along with one's citizenship and one's uh, being, one being here in the United States. Now, <clears throat> this talk tonight is entitled The Ethos of Public Service. And as I was going back through my, my notes, as I spoke last week before at Emory University on the ethics and integrity of uh, CIA, I wanted to refresh my, my mind about what the definition of ethos is in terms of what the dictionary says it is. It says that ethos is the fundamental character or spirit of a culture. The underlying sentiment that informs the beliefs, the customs, the practices of a group or a society. And when I think about that, American ethos really does equal public service because of, again, our great exceptionalism. Now, I think public service takes many, many forms. And many of you here and the students that I've talked to, you are aspiring national security or intelligence professionals, and I encourage you to continue with those aspirations and those ambitions. But many of you who teach here, the professors, you provide public service in terms of enlightenment and sharing your expertise and your knowledge. Obviously, our first responders, police, firemen. I am. I have three children, and uh, for whatever reason, none of them decided to follow in my footsteps in national security and intelligence. <laughs> uh, but I am very proud that all, each of them, in a very special way, um, contribute to public service. My son is a. EMT specialist and paramedic and a volunteer fireman. And it's one of the things that he has dedicated his life to, to be able to help the members of our community and of our county. Uh, and my, my two girls also are doing things in, in the, the area of charity and other things. Uh, and so what I've tried to do throughout the course of, of my life is to make sure that my children understand their obligations, not just to themselves, but to their, their fellow Americans and fellow men. And so I talked to many student groups, and I spoke a couple months ago to um, Boy State in Missouri, about 950 or so high school juniors that had graduated with great enthusiasm and energy and overachievers, and they're looking forward to their professional careers, and I'm sure that many of them are going to go into many different uh, professional uh, pursuits. And uh, I really did emphasize the importance uh, of public service to them because they are where they are, and they have these opportunities because of where they were born and uh, the great uh, benefits that uh, accrue to individuals here in the United States. And I remember talking to one of the individuals um, mm -hmm. uh, before my, my talk, so he didn't have the, the wisdom of my words, and I said, so what do you want to accomplish? And uh, very enthusiastically, he said, well, I want to be a millionaire by the time I'm 30. <laughs> and so that was not exactly part of my, the themes that I was going to be emphasizing that night. I said, well, if you want to be a millionaire by the time you're 30, well, what do you want to do with that? He goes, oh, well, he's going into business or whatever. And I said, well, you know, is, if money is your goal, um, I find that very unrewarding and not very enriching at all. Now, if you said that you wanted to be able to create some type of, of new technology or some new innovation that is going to help people do whatever, and in the process, then, you're going to make a million dollars, I think that is great. And being able to combine one's passion and one's enjoyment and what one is good at, as well as being able to make a living, living uh, to me, I think that really is the ideal. And um, one of the things that, uh, as I've talked to a very variety of businesses now, and in New York, private equity firms and others, mm -hmm. one of the phrases that is becoming more and more popular among them, and rightly so, is... There's the profit world, and then there's the not-for-profits. But the phrase that now that the private sector is adapting or adopting is not just for profit. Yes, uh, the American uh, economy uh, thrives on our capitalist foundations. And we want to make sure that the engine of our economy continues to be fueled by this tremendous capitalism that we have in this country. But at the same time, I think an increasing number of individuals in these areas are recognizing that they also do have an obligation to 
their fellow man and fellow Americans. And so it's one of the things that I have been pleased with, seeing that people are now looking at things in terms of what can they do in addition to maybe making that million dollars. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> one of the key messages tonight that I want to convey um, is that I think we all have to recognize and then act upon uh, not only our responsibilities to ourselves in terms of advancement and professional growth, as well as to our families, but also our responsibilities and I think obligations to our, our fellow man and fellow Americans. And that's why when I look out and I see so many young students here and those who are just embarking on their careers, and I'm very, very jealous. Uh, I mentioned earlier, I can vividly recall being in a, the students' chairs uh, and listening when I was at UT here in the late 1970s. And I was, again, very fortunate to be able to have a career that I enjoyed and felt very enriched with. But I, I do think that all of you can serve this country in, in a variety of ways, and not just in the national security or intelligence fields, but in ways that you're going to really be thinking about what you can do in order to make sure that the ethos of this country, the fundamental character or spirit of a culture, the underlying sentiment that informs the beliefs, customs, practices of a group or society are really going to be uh, viewed in what it is that, that you do. Now, what I want to do is to talk a little bit about the special ethos and obligations that attend to our elected officials and those serving in government positions. And again, I was a tremendous, tremendous beneficiary of having opportunities at CIA, at the White House, uh, abroad, uh, to be, really be a witness to uh, U.S. foreign policy, uh, U.S. intelligence, being part of that uh, environment that really contributes to keeping this country safe and secure. And during the course of my 33 years or so of service, I was able to observe exemplary service, as well as to observe less than exemplary service. Because uh, I feel, uh, after my experience in, in the government and national security, individuals who are given the responsibility to make or to carry out or to interpret our laws, they have obligations that attach to their positions that are ex especially solemn. And they need to recognize that as they attain those positions, they need to be able to fulfill the roles and the obligations uh, of those positions and what it is that their fellow Americans expect of them. They are entrusted with the authority and the discretion to do what is right for this country, which means to safeguard our liberties, to safeguard our freedom, our security, our prosperity, and indeed to safeguard American exceptionalism so that our children and our children's children and their children and grandchildren are going to be able to enjoy all of the benefits and bounties of this, this great land. I had the tremendous good fortune from 1980, and with a little bit of an interregnum in the private sector, up until January 20th of this year, to serve for six presidents, three Republicans and three Democrats. I should say, I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. In, in fact, um, I have been skewered lately, and I was mentioning this in the class today, that uh, at the tender age of 1921 uh, in 1976, the first time I got to vote in the presidential election, I was already turned off by partisan politics, and so I decided to, to vote for uh, Gus Hall, who was the communist uh, party. <laughs> <laughs> and so now that has attached to me, and will forever be attached to me. And so if you go on Twitter, you'll see people refer to me as the commie director of CIA. <laughs> But I acknowledge that publicly because what I said to a, a group of young individuals who were aspiring to come into CIA, one young woman said she's politically active on campus and is that going to be, is that going to inhibit her uh, being accepted into the agency? And uh, I said, well, it depends on what you're doing, you know, firebombing the you know, buildings, that's, that's probably going to be a bit of a deterrent. Um, but, and I gave the example of having voted communist and my polygrapher at the time, I was very frightened in terms of what I was going to say, uh, but I told him that I had voted communist. And he said, that is your right. And I was so impressed uh, back in 1980 that even though I had voted communist in a presidential election, 
for not a good reason, but I was 21 and decided to do something different. Uh, that, that didn't prevent me from getting to the CIA, and I thank my lucky stars that I had the polygrapher who was willing to accept my vote for Gus Hall in 1976. <laughs> That's one communist clapping here. <laughs> he wasn't elected, but uh, he was uh, you know, always on those, those balance. Uh, but I served for those six presidents, the three Democrats and three Republicans, and for each one of them, I had such tremendous respect and admiration because and I didn't agree with everything that they did or the policies they pursued. Uh, but And I got to know the last three fairly well, and I observed time after time that they really were looking to do what was best for this country. And I heard on several occasions from at least two of them, when they said, damn the politics, we need to do this. And at a time of such partisan bickering, I really was very encouraged to see that the persons who were able to achieve the position of Chief Executive Commander-in-Chief of this country, who were entrusted with keeping us safe and secure and free, were willing to do the right thing, even though it might have cost them politically. Um, one of the most um, impressive demonstrations of the ethos of public service was when I had the great good fortune, and, and Steve Slick remembers this because he was at the White House at the time, was in December and January, and then on January 20th of 2009, when Barack Obama was going to become the President of the United States. And in the days preceding that, that uh, inauguration, there was some threat information that was of concern. And um, throughout the course of the transition from a Republican administration under George W. Bush to the ascension of President Barack Obama, Democrat, the Bush administration could not have been more gracious, more supportive, more encouraging, more forthcoming as they passed that mental leadership from one administration of one particular party to another. It was, I wonder. And on the morning of inauguration day, where we had gathered in the White House Situation Room, and the secretaries and directors of the relevant departments and agencies related to security, and the incoming team were there in the White House together. And to me, it was the most vivid demonstration that I've ever had about the strength of this democracy. And even though uh, George Bush campaigned against uh, Barack Obama, well, that transition was an exemplar of what this country should be about. It was to such a great extent that President Obama told us early on in his administration that not only was he so appreciative of that, but he wanted to make sure that we do everything possible to ensure that the subsequent transition to the next president, whoever that might be, is going to be as good, if not even better, than what we had experienced. And it's because that we needed to have that type of support from the outgoing administration in order to take over the solemn responsibilities that attend to those positions. And so it really was uh, remarkable, and it's one of the things that I will never forget, and that I think is um, again, a demonstration of just how strong we can be when we want to be. Now, all of these presidents recognized that they were responsible for protecting the security, security of all Americans, the welfare of all Americans, and the opportunities of all Americans. And not just to advance their own interests or their, their party's interests. And at this day and age in Washington, where the partisan orders run deep and are rather royal, it is very difficult to be able to see the same type of demonstration of commitment to this, this country. The state of discourse among our politicians and elected officials today is in deep disrepair. The rancor, <laughs> and the and invective that are pervasive in political circles right now should never define the American ethos either for ourselves or for the people around the world. But unfortunately, I think we are at a point, a very important juncture, in terms of what does public service mean on behalf of the country, and that our elected officials, 
really need to be able to reflect that ethos America, of America, which is designed to, to protect and defend, support all Americans, irrespective of whether or not they might have supported the president in a, in a campaign or the policies that a individual advocates. Now, I've tried to keep a low profile, publicly speaking, since I left uh, office in January this year. Sometimes my, my Irish roots get the better of me, and sometimes when I see things happening, and I see either dishonesty or, especially, when I see individuals impugning the integrity and the mission and the sacrifices of the women and men of the CIA and intelligence community, I tend to speak my mind. Uh, <clears throat> but I am very concerned uh, when I look around the world at a time in the 21st century when our, our world faces just such a broad array of very complex and complicated problems. That goes from terrorism to, to cyber to instability to violence to bloodshed and something across the world, uh, the humanitarian disasters that we face, uh, the lack of, uh, of respect for human rights in so many countries. But through the course of my intelligence and security career, I frequently had to brief the president and National Security Council members about uh, the status of various governments and whether or not their officials were able to be up to the challenges that they faced. And I was struck over time how more and more of the individuals who aspire to and then achieve these positions are, uh, are incompetent, inept, and corrupt, and are um, not just unwilling but also unable to carry out their public service responsibilities. I gave a lecture in London earlier this year, and whenever you give a lecture in, in London or the UK, it's very formal and it has to be you know, all written out and delivered. And so uh, it was a, called the Dimbleby Lecture. Uh, Richard Dimbleby was the uh, British equivalent of Walter Cronkite, and every year they give a, and have someone give a lecture. And I talked about all the challenges we face worldwide, and I talked about how the, the trend, at least, has been, in my estimation, that we have people who then get to these positions of authority but do not have the background, the training, the experience that is necessary in order to deal with the very complex challenges of the 21st century. And I said in that lecture, and only half tongue in cheek, that maybe we should consider having some type of eligibility requirements for people to even run for office. I know that when I go to the dentist, I want to make sure that the person who is operating on my teeth has gone to dental school. Uh, the same thing is true for the doctor, or the lawyer, or the judge. We have certain qualifications and credentials that they need to meet in order to carry out those uh, professional duties. We don't have the same type of requirements in any way for individuals who run for office. And uh, there are a lot of people around the world who are able to attain uh, celebrity status as well as uh, have name recognition that uh, they then use in order to uh, be elected. And I really do believe that, again, the complexity of the problems we face today really requires individuals to at least have a, a modicum of experience in terms of history and the Constitution, mm -hmm. as well as global events and the complexities of these problems. So, <clears throat> again, I said they have plenty of cheap. Maybe there's a way, maybe University of Texas can create some type of seal of approval <laughs> that somebody has gone through a program here and they at least have uh, been exposed to uh, those uh, issues, those topics and subjects uh, that are going to be required for them to carry out their, their duties uh, capably. <clears throat> so, again, I have tried not to be um, in any way partisan, because I'm not, but I am very um, concerned when we have public officials who are uh, misleading the American people who are being dishonest and are not living up to the American ethos of public service. And I think we do need to hold people to account in, in our democratic ways. <clears throat> I was in Boston this past weekend. Um, well, I've just finished up a program up there in University of Massachusetts, and uh, we had uh, about two and a half hours or so. And I went over to the JFK Library. And one of the things I really encourage people to do is, you have the LBJ library here, which is terrific. But mm -hmm. to the extent that you can go to other presidential libraries, I've been to the Nixon and Reagan library. 
I had no sense of the JFK library. And so as we spent the two and a half hours there walking through the various displays and uh, looking at the memorabilia of, of Kennedy, um, I sat and watched uh, a good part of the Nixon-Kennedy debate of 1960. And I was surprised, and I had seen some of the things before, but I was surprised at the civility, the respect that each of them had for the other. And how each of them were saying that it will be up to the American people to decide whether or not the policies that are being advocated by, by me or my, uh, the other candidate, meets what it is that they expect of a president. And throughout that, it was very contentious, as you know, uh, presidential campaign. But the civility was there throughout. And it was, uh, again, just a, uh, a very vivid demonstration to me about how we can have the discourse among our politicians, among our elected officials, that recognizes that, that they have certain obligations that they really should never forget, which is to, in my mind, to role model, especially for young Americans, what it means to be uh, a, an official of the U.S. government. I know that Paul and Steve and myself always remembered any time that we carried out our duties and responsibilities, we were not just representing ourselves, we were representing the CIA. I must tell you, that is a very, very humbling responsibility. And we always try to live up to what the CIA expected of us. I think our politicians and our, some of our officials need to remember that they're not just representing themselves, they're representing what's supposed to be best about this country. Not just to American citizens, but also to citizens around the world. <clears throat> when I was going through the JFK library, and again, I encourage people, if you have the chance to be in Boston, to take advantage of that. I also, though, watched his very famous inaugural speech of January 20th, 1961, which many of those phrases, I think, are embedded in our, our minds and our memories. And when I was listening to that, I was thinking about how much it applies to the current day. Back in 1960, we were locked in this Cold War. And got increasingly hot with uh, the Soviet Union. But the types of things that John F. Kennedy was saying about responsibilities and obligations to our country as well as to the world are very worthy to, um, to review and to remind ourselves of. And before we open up the questions, let me just take a few moments to talk to uh, read the, the last couple of paragraphs there. Many of it, most of it will be very uh, familiar to you. It says, in the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion, which, with, which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it and the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. And finally, whether you are citizens of America or citizens of the world, ask of us here the same high standards of strength and sacrifice which we ask of you. With a good conscience, our only sure reward, with history, the final judge of our deeds, let us go forth to lead the land we love, asking his blessings and his help, but knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. Public service is something that we all need to carry with us, I believe, and something that we need to make sure is valued and is recognized and something that we want our children and our children's children to be able to carry on. And so, again, I want to thank the University of Texas community for helping me get launched in my career, uh, the experiences I had here in Texas. And I won't talk about the great accomplishments of the football teams in the 1970s, but, no. <laughs> but it really was very formative in terms of what I was able to uh, take as I started my CA career. Uh, so thank you very much.
you hear us if we just leave these sitting sitting here? Yeah. Does that sound okay? Thanks very much, John. That was uh, for those remarks and also for your decision to rejoin the University of Texas family. We're, we're delighted to have you here for forward to a second chapter that's as rich and productive as the as the first. Um, the forums team is doing worse than the UT team here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so to the benefit of the audience, I should probably round out the picture here somewhat and, and explain what else John is doing. In addition to <coughs> terrific public events like this one, John's going to spend a few days uh, with us here this week, uh, come back in the spring. Uh, we've arranged a busy schedule for you, so what we have in mind is John was already at my class this afternoon up at the LBJ School of Intelligence Seminar. Tomorrow's going to be meeting with a Plan 2 group with Professor Pope. Uh, you're scheduled for research interviews uh, that are underway by a student team at the, at the LBJ School. There'll be counseling and mentoring sessions, as you know, with folks from the Middle East Studies Department and also the Clements. Uh, undergraduate fellows and, and on and on and on. So we think John's affiliation with the university is just a tremendous opportunity for our students and uh, we want to work you hard to take full advantage. Well, I'm looking forward, forward to coming back. My wife is very much looking forward to coming back. Uh, she supported me throughout graduate school. <laughs> she was a physical education teacher at some of the elementary schools here in Austin. And, uh, one well, of the reasons why she encouraged me to get a job so I could help support us throughout my doctoral career. Sounds like payback time. <laughs> All right. So uh, here's what we have in mind as, as Paul previewed for you. Uh, I'm just going to ask John a couple of questions, maybe one or two on public service, theme of the remarks this evening. Uh, a couple on intelligence and national security, because I can't resist. Uh, and then we're going to open up the floor uh, to the rest of you and, and uh, let John deal with issues that are on your mind. Public service, your your time. Let me talk about uh, or ask you about diversity and inclusion. Something you've already addressed once before on this campus, but I want to I want to revisit it. You took very seriously during your time as the director of the Central Intelligence Agency uh, efforts to, to remedy what I think most of us would admit is a is a weak record uh, that the CIA has has earned over many years in terms of recruiting, hiring, promoting, advancing leadership opportunities female officers as well as underrepresented groups African Americans Hispanics and others uh, you took that on can you tell us a little bit about what you found when you looked into it what steps you took and, and where you think you left it because this is a long-term challenge there well as you point out the agency doesn't have a stellar record when it comes to diversity inclusion and when I started in 1980 there were certain people that would not be granted security clearances, uh, members of the LGBT community. And uh, over the course of, of the years, I think there were uh, members of various minority groups that also were disadvantaged because they didn't have the opportunities to, to grow. I was uh, had a tremendous good fortune of following David Petraeus, who had initiated a study on women in the agency, women in leadership. And he had Madeline Albright spearhead that effort. And so, that, that study and the recommendations came to my desk within a month of my becoming director. Madeline was asking whether or not I should, she should still deliver it. I said, absolutely, want it. And the key was to make sure there's going to be an action plan. It's one thing to have a study done and then it you know, gathers dust on the shelf. But we had an implementation team, and there were about 10 recommendations. And within those recommendations, there were sub-recommendations. And we stayed with it. And one of the things we want to do is to make it mainstream. So it wasn't, you know, an office over here. It was part of our, our leadership team that I held people to account in terms of what are you doing. But also then I asked Vernon Jordan, who was part of the Clinton administration, <coughs> and a very accomplished individual, to spearhead a similar study on diversity in leadership. And uh, when that study came forward, it was harshly critical of the agency. It was critical, not so much that the leadership of the agency was not committed to realizing the, the goals of this inclusion, but there wasn't uh, an institutional durability, uh, endurance in terms of some of these initiatives, uh, because the mission would drive CIA officers, and frequently the leadership would be going from one crisis to another crisis, and a lot of these other things would be on the back burner. And so one of the things we did commit to do was to make sure that on diversity as well as on women within the agency, 
that we were going to, again, mainstream this. We were going to make it part of people's evaluations in terms of leadership. We were going to look at the metrics. But also, what we didn't want to do is just all of a sudden appoint a few people who were either female or of minority status to senior positions. Because if you don't have the institution that's supporting it from the standpoint of training and development and mentoring and coaching and all of that, you're not going to have a sustained program. So it is something that is, is critically important to, to us. Jim Clapper also was a very strong advocate within the intelligence community. In fact, Susan Rice asked me and Jim Clapper to talk to the rest of the National Security Council about all the things that we were doing because we were, in fact, further ahead. There are two other reasons why I did this. One is that I can think of no other agency or department in the U.S. government that can make a better business case for diversity and inclusion. CIA has to cover the world, all of its diversity in terms of languages, ethnicities, cultures, whatever. And so if we're not taking advantage of this tremendous melting pot here in the United States, we are sub-optimizing our capabilities to follow, to, to do our, our mission. So it, it's just natural for us to do that. It's also the right thing to do. And maybe I'm making up for some lost time. Uh, when I grew up in Jersey, I, I ran with some tough crowds. And there were things that I was a part of that I... Uh, deeply regret and feel as though I was complicit in, um, in things that I said or did that were um, reprehensible in some respects. Um, and it's because you get into this group thing, but I, I felt that my silence and my, my allowing things to happen um, was something that I, I truly, truly regret. And so maybe it's making up for lost time. Because I, I, I know the pain that was caused to some people when I was younger when they were referred to by a certain derogatory term or when they were um, abused because of their sexual preference orientation. Uh, and I look back on those times and I, I, I deeply, deeply regret that um, I was a part of that. So a combination of reasons. Uh, this country, uh, in terms of our ethos, what are those sentiments that actually underlie our beliefs, our actions? That should be, diversity inclusion is, should be embedded in the ethos of Americans and the ethos, certainly, of public servants. Thanks. Uh, you, do you sense that it's institutionalized uh, at this point or readily reversible? Is this, is this your personal issue or they portray us as? Or I think this is. I'd like to say. I like to think that it's sustained. And I'm not going to critique uh, what my successor is, is doing, whatever else. But um, <laughs> what I told our our workforce, and I, the the last week of my tenure, we had a uh, an event in the auditorium about diversity and inclusion, and it was combined with Martin Luther King Day and other things. And I was telling our workforce. You're empowered now. We've put in motion these activities, these actions. And although the, the winds of change at the political level might be shifting, because I think there was some anxiety in terms of what was happening, I said, you have now the obligation and responsibility to see this through. Mm -hmm. That you know that it's right. Mm -hmm. You know it's right because it helps our mission. You know it's right because we are the CIA and we are Americans. Don't be deterred. If you see something that's wrong, speak out. If you see something that needs to be changed, try to be a part of that change uh, initiative. So I, I like to think that it's sufficiently ingrained and that we put it into our training programs, our development programs, the evaluations, other things. I think it'll be difficult to just pull that up. Terrific, thanks. I'm, I'm mindful of the time and we want to get everybody out of here on time. We appreciate you coming through the harsh weather. So I'm going to truncate. Uh, skip to one question I wanted to ask you about business, uh, about intelligence and national security. I think we told you, or we probably even invited you, uh, last month we had a national security forum down here at the Clement Center, the Strauss Center. Terrific group of public servants. Your successor, Director Pompeo, was here to deliver keynote remarks. We deliberately chose as a topic for that event America's national security alliances and partnerships, because we had a collective sense, that's Will Imboden, Bobby Chesney, Steve Slick, I won't speak for anybody else, that um, we weren't being mindful enough as a government of the 
these relationships weren't being attentive enough to them, we depended critically on them, yet they were not getting the attention they deserved. Um, you spoke, I thought, eloquently several years ago at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York and included a long section of your remarks on these relationships. That's unusual to the extent that you were describing the intelligence and security relationships. But what should people know about this? I think they may be among the most important, but least understood of America's international and bilateral relationships or those that exist in the intelligence channels. But what can you tell folks about those? Well, just speaking for CIA, CIA has well over, I think, 150 or 200 relationships with intelligence security services around the world. They are so important to us um, for a variety of reasons. One is, as good as we are at CIA, uh, we need to rely on the capabilities of other services uh, for you know, countering terrorism and for dealing with you know, proliferation and, and you name it. We also use these relationships in order to increase the professionalism of the intelligence security services. And we have been instrumental in creating some intelligence services that really have been essential to maintaining peace, stability, and order in some countries. And we also try to make sure that they understand that you are not instruments of your political masters. You have responsibilities to again protect the welfare, the well-being, the security of your people, and also, though you know, they they will pursue their national security interests. The United States, again, when it's talking about American exceptionalism, we have this global responsibility like no other country has on every part of this planet. Um, I remember when during the Obama administration we were doing the Asia pivot. I would go to Europe, and the Europeans would say, what is this, you're forgetting about us? No, we're not forgetting about you, but you know, we have all of these relationships that we have to nurture and develop. And I am concerned about some of the signals that are coming out <coughs> from Washington that tend to um, not emphasize the importance of these relationships. I was at a conference two months ago with a lot of senior European former officials, prime ministers and front ministers and others, and they say that the transatlantic alliance is in near crisis because they question whether or not they can look to the United States to play that role, not just the security guarantor vis-a-vis -vis Soviets and now Russia, but also that they can rely on the relationship with the United States to not just promote the interest and prosperity of the United States, but to help all ships rise. They remember very well you know, the Marshall Plan after World War II. And it was that the United States, of course, is going to advance its interests, but not at the expense of others. And now they are concerned that what they're hearing is it's America first, second, and third, and we're going to use our great muscularity uh, on so many fronts, on trade, commerce, uh, economics, to advantage ourselves in all these bilateral agreements. And we're going to be stepping away from a lot of the multilateral understandings agreements that really are in collective interests. So, uh, you know, I, CIA plays a very important role, particularly at times when the political relations between countries go down. There have been many instances where the relationship that CIA had with its foreign counterpart allowed certain political relationships to recover. Jordan is a great example. CIA and Jordan have very close relations over the years. When Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait back in 1990, um, King Hussein uh, made his, I think, most serious mistake when he sided with Saddam Hussein. And it plummeted U.S. Jordanian relations. But the U.S. CIA and Jordanian GID relationship continued to be the channel through which we would be able to communicate and interact. So these intelligence relationships serve multiple purposes. They are a demonstration of U.S. commitment to trying to increase the capabilities of our partners and allies. You know, there are channels that we can provide them very critical information that will keep their people safe. But also it provides a, a channel that uh, is discreet um, and uh, not uh, plastered all over the world in 140 characters, <laughs> which is not the way to conduct some of these foreign policy matters. Uh, so it's a, to me, it's a very reliable one and one that's carried out in a very professional way, almost irrespective of the politics. Right, and certainly we left after our conference with the understanding that these are not to be taken for granted. They require care and attention, discipline and respect, and, and the ability to listen. Uh, 
Okay, um, John and I could talk for hours, and we have, but um, I'm going to do this informally and just ask folks to raise your hand. We have a spotlight in our eyes, so it's a, a little harder to see. I see one of my friends here, Sierra. Hi. Yeah. How are you? Fine, thanks, Sierra. Um, my name is Sierra Miller. I'm uh, an undergrad student studying international relations. Um, and I wanted to know what you make of people like Edward Snowden and Julian Assange who say that they break the law in the name of public service. Yes, the question is what I think about people like uh, Mr. Snowden and Julius Assange, who, and Assange is different than yes. Snowden. Snowden was someone who worked for the U.S. government, raised his hand, right hand, and swore an oath of allegiance to the country to protect its security and protect its secrets, and then violated it in the most outrageous way in my mind. You already know which way I'm going on. You were just being... Maybe a little. Now, when he tells the story, he was doing this great public service. There were many options that Mr. Snowden could have taken advantage of if he wanted to pursue this crusade of his. <coughs> Inspector Generals, there's the Intelligence Committees, there are whistleblower provisions. There are a lot of things that he could have done, but he didn't do that. What did he do? He absconded overseas and then talked with the Chinese and the Russians and shared with the Chinese and Russians a lot of critical national security issues, matters, which greatly compromises our ability to continue to have the insights we need. And that took years and years of investment, not just in terms of resource and money, but also hard work, as well as great risk-taking on the part of individuals, not Americans, who do things because they believe in America. And so Mr. Snowden took it upon himself to blow this because, for whatever reason, so I consider him treasonous. I think he needs to come back here and, and face a, a jury of his peers and to stand trial for, for that. Now, I'm sure he has a much different perspective on this. I'm not going to give Mr. Bowden, Mr. Stone any, any credit. Subsequent to those, his, his releases, uh, President Obama initiated a number of reviews about some of the collection programs that, uh, quite frankly, were on autopilot and needed reviews. And again, I think that was important, that it was necessary, and it could have been done without Mr. Snowden, again, dishonoring himself and this country in the way he did. So, I'm curious to hear the second half of Sierra's question. Is there a different perspective on the, the WikiLeaks organization? Director Pompeo spoke to that somewhat when he was here, and its leader, Mr. Assange, they, they described themselves as, a, as a, a media organization engaged in some more altruistic or lawful activity. And the director referred to them, frankly, as a, as a uh, uh, proxy of the Russian intelligence services. How is it different? How, how, do you, how do you judge an organization like that that's willing to shop around secret information from any government, that, government source that I find? I think there are individuals and organizations around the world, uh, and <coughs> Mr. Assange and, and uh, WikiLeaks is part of this network, that really uh, believe in total transparency and uncovering the secrets of governments because they believe that there are a lot of abuses that are taking place. And the only way that governments can be held to account is to do that. And I think some individuals, I'm not saying Assange, but some individuals who have this attitude, I think are doing it for what they believe are legitimate purposes. And they think that they're performing a public service. At the same time, a number of these individuals and, and organizations are being manipulated and exploited by foreign uh, foreign adversaries. The Russians are very adept at that. Uh, and I have to give much respect to the Russian intelligence security services. Uh, they are quite, quite agile in, uh, in so many areas. And so individuals who may have the best of intentions uh, at heart can easily be manipulated and exploited by uh, foreign intelligence services, uh, either wittingly or unwittingly. And so I think Mr. Assange knows that uh, he is doing uh, Russia's bidding. Uh, sometimes he's doing it because of the Russians. Sometimes 
it happens to, I think, complement what the Russians are trying to accomplish. Others? Mm -hmm. Sir? Uh, thank you for coming, Director Brennan. Really appreciate it. <clears throat> um, I'm curious, in the post uh, in the post-Cold War world, the United States obviously had hegemonic power, and we thought that you know capitalism and, and liberal democracy was going to be um, going forward, the end of history, so to speak. And in the last five years, we've seen a real resurgence of both the state as a threat, and also, um, you know, obviously with what's happening with Russia and the rise of China. I guess my question is. Do you foresee a new ideological struggle similar to the Cold War against the liberal world order, or do you think this is more of a, just a raw power uh, situation, if that makes sense? I think the momentum that was established after World War II as far as the growth of liberal democracies around the world, uh, as many countries were coming out of the yoke of cold colonialism, and uh, I think that momentum has slowed, if not stopped, and in some areas been reversed. That same conference that I was talking about before, about the transatlantic alliance crisis, one of the takeaways from this conference was that they believe that authoritarianism is on the rise around the world. And I think you can you know, look at so many countries and see how there has been this increasing arrogation of authority and power among some of these individuals who, I guess, aspire to be emperor, dictator, or whatever. You see it in the Philippines, you see it in Turkey. You also are seeing it right now play out in Saudi Arabia. As, you know, it's hard to say that a monarchy is going to become more authoritarian. Well, in fact, there's much greater consolidation of power in the hands of Mohammed Salman, the crown prince there. And you see this in a number of countries for a variety of reasons. One is that the complexity of the challenges that people face, that, that governments face, are beyond the capabilities of a lot of countries to governments to address. And so what do they do? They resort to repression. They resort to using their security services. They resort to delegitimizing the institutions of, of uh, society, whether it be the media or judiciary or other things. And so I really do see that the trend now is against the liberal democratic order in, in many countries. And I, and this is one area where I will speak out, um, I do believe that the signals coming out of Washington right now are abetting that. And I think it's encouraging individuals to pursue these these paths. So, and all countries have their own sort of unique set of circumstances. Xi Jinping, I think, is a very cunning and clever individual and came out of this most recent People's Congress with even greater authority and he's now in the Constitution. I don't see him giving up power in 2022. I think what a lot of authoritarian real leaders realize is that retirement is not um, all that... Uh, you know, healthy in some respects. So they want to try to stay on as long as they can, Mr. Putin also. And so I, I don't see a lot of movement on the democratic front. And we haven't talked about populism, but populism is, is a real issue uh, that, that really is abetting the forces of, of ultra-nationalism that is, is leading to individuals to, you know, have this, this banner of, you know, um, I think, uh, authoritarianism. So I, I am concerned about, about these, these these trends that are happening globally. Uh, uh, and I think it's the next several years are going to be rather uh, critical in terms of how the, the world deals with it. The United States needs has always been the country to hold a lot of these countries to account yeah. in terms of the abuses of human rights, repression, authoritarianism, and we're not doing that now. We're not doing it the way that the United States has done in the past. And I think that is, uh, is the real problem. Thank you, John. Well, I'm glad you included in your response a comment on Saudi Arabia. That's one of the, one of the questions that uh, we didn't get to for time. And I would encourage folks interested in following up on the human rights theme to go find that dissertation from 1980. <laughs> <laughs> Check it out. Let me know what it says. I think we may have time for, for, for one more. One more call. Thanks. Um, up here. So you acknowledge that so many of the people in the audience tonight are students who are going to go into the intelligence agency. Um, what specifically, you know, there are certain jobs, I'm an attorney, UT grad, UT law grad, certain jobs we all have, you have to check your police at the door when you're going to do your job. So what specifically did you do at the CIA, and do you want these students to understand that 
they need to be able to check their beliefs at the door. To do Can you expand upon that? Check your beliefs at the door. Uh, uh, political. Uh, our, our intelligence agencies should not be politicized, and they should not be weaponized against, especially against the American citizenry. So, what specifically did you do at your time at CIA to avoid that? And what can you encourage these young people to understand that if you're going to go into intelligence, there are certain things that you you believe, but you're you cannot bring that to work for you. Well, okay, uh, that's an important question. I said I'm neither Republican nor Democrat, but I'm sure most people at CIA are either Republicans or Democrats, right. and that's that's who they are, and that's absolutely they should continue to pursue that from a personal standpoint. There is a real obligation on the part of intelligence officers to remain apolitical, nonpartisan, objective, and independent, because. It really is incumbent upon the intelligence community, intelligence officers, to be able to speak the proverbial truth to power. So that as politicians may have some preconceived notions about which policy courses they want to go down, intelligence cannot be used in order to provide support to that if, in fact, the intelligence doesn't bear that out. So when I would talk to classes, I would talk about the, the solemn obligation that CIA officers have that even you need to make sure that you're going to be able to um, characterize a situation as best you can in terms of what it is that you know, what is it that you assess, what is it that you don't know, what are the gaps in your knowledge. And so you cannot be a policy advocate, but that doesn't mean that you're going to be irrelevant to policy. You need to be able to bring your expertise to it. There are many times that I had to go down to the White House and talk to the presidents or members of the National Security Council about issues that I had my own views about which policy course we should pursue. And I had to keep reminding myself that I didn't want to convey in any way in my presentation what was the better, what was the course that I advocated for. I tried to highlight some of the advantages and disadvantages of you know, certain options and try to explain exactly what the situation was. But I, I needed to be as objective as possible. That's a, sometimes it's a tough thing for individuals within the intelligence community. Not that they're going to be political, but maintaining that objectivity so that as you're talking to the consumers of it, the policymakers, the ones that have to make the choices, you want to make sure that you give them as comprehensive, as objective, almost as neutral a view about what is happening and what it is that the intelligence community knows. Again, it goes back to what I said before. Whenever we would go out and represent CIA, we were representing CIA, not representing John or Steve or Paul or whatever. And so you have to make sure that your own personal sort of preferences on certain things are, are not is not going to color inappropriately your your intelligence that you provide. So uh, I, I think it, it it is so important that the policymakers. Um, can count on the intelligence officers bringing forward what frequently are inconvenient truths. And there are many times that I'm sure we all had the opportunities to bring forward to presidents and others things that really they didn't want to hear because, God, that just complicates things so much or, you know, it, it makes it more difficult to pursue a certain, a certain path. And that's where it really is up to the intelligence officer to, to give that to the, to the president or others. And without exception, for the people that I, I briefed, they may challenge it, they may try to understand as much as they can about it, but um, they, I never had a feeling that uh, what I was doing was not appreciated by them. Mm -hmm. It was always valued, and it, was, it, it enabled them to make the best decision again on behalf of this country. And that's where intelligence is so critical to security. Because there are a lot of people, and a lot of people come into government and policymakers who think that they have the solutions to very complicated problems and their instinct and gut tells them to do certain things. <coughs> the CIA in particular has such tremendously talented experts on basically any issue around the world. And those individuals really require are, are needed in order to make sure that those who have a rather superficial understanding about a lot of these issues really have a, a dose of reality. Uh, and one of the things that I think the lessons that we learned at CIA was that uh, a lot of times these policymakers are 
our lawyers and, and come to training. And as you well know, uh, and I'm, I'm a wannabe lawyer, I'm a, I'm a wannabe a lot of things, but I've always wanted to go to law school. And a very successful life in you know, law school and, and intelligence work. Uh, defense attorneys or prosecutors will ask the witnesses certain questions, leading questions, because they want a response that supports their, their case, either to prosecute or to acquit. And one of the things that we really try to make sure that CI officers understand is that you need to be able to make sure that you're able to respond not just to the question, but to the issue. And I think it was a lesson we learned in certain instances where there were individuals in the White House that wanted to get, let's say, a list of all of the intelligence reports that supported a certain policy path. We have an obligation not just to give them that litany of all those things, but also to do the assessment to say whether or not it's bogus or reliable or whatever, but also be able to make sure that we're not just responding to leading questions of those very adept lawyers. So again, this is all part of your training as an intelligence officer. Whether you're a case officer, an analyst, or you know, anything within the agency, I think it's 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 told to you early on in your career what your role is in national security. You are the ones that are going to keep people sort of on the right track. You're the one who's going to make sure that that the truth, as far as we know it, comes through. It's in our storied lobby of CIA headquarters. Knowing the truth. Knowing the truth. The truth does set you free. Uh, and that's what you know intelligence is, is about. Stephen and I had the great opportunity to serve on both the intelligence side and the policy side of that relationship. And to me, I found serving on the policy side was, was really quite enlightening about the intelligence side and that relationship. Uh, and uh, that's why I do think that the independence, the objectivity, the nonpartisan, apolitical nature of the intelligence is so critically important. And it's up to the leadership of the intelligence community the Director of National Intelligence, Director of CIA, to make sure that they maintain that integrity and that honesty so that our intelligence agencies are not going to be exploited and manipulated by uh, political leaders who are not fulfilling their public service ethos. But to be clear, nobody asked an incoming CIA officer to uh, leave their passion or their constitutional rights at home. They can bring them to work, but they have to perform in the way John described. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. We'll continue in the spring. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so